Hello, everyone, and welcome to this third town hall event during the time of the coronavirus on June 18th, 2020, sponsored by Brooklyn for Peace. My name is Thomas Cox. I'm a member of Brooklyn for Peace and chair of its Israel-Palestine Committee. Please note, everyone, that this meeting is being recorded. Tonight, we will hear live testimonies from three of the survivors of the Israeli attack on the Navy ship USS Liberty, American servicemen who have a dramatic and horrendous story to tell us. First, however, I'd like to introduce Charlotte Phillips, chairperson and co-founder of Brooklyn for Peace, who will tell you a bit about our organization. Charlotte? Thanks, Tom. Before we get into the program, I want to take a moment of silence to remember and honor those lives lost on the USS Liberty in 1967, as well as those of Black Americans, Rayshard Brooks, George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Ahmad Arbery, Tony McQuaid, and too many others of all ethnicities lost to police brutality and violence in the recent weeks, as well as over the years, and the lives of Palestinians and Israelis lost in the ongoing conflict there. So let's just take a moment of silence. Okay, thank you. Brooklyn for Peace has been working in Brooklyn since 1984. Our core mission is the prevention of war and the social and economic injustices which lead to war. We are primarily an educational organization, but we see active response to injustice as a vital component of our work. Our Israel-Palestine Committee seeks to educate ourselves about the conflict in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. We organize events such as this one and encourage actions leading to a negotiated solution, respect for international law, and equal rights for all. If you're not already a member of Brooklyn for Peace, please go to our website, brooklynpeace, all one word, dot O-R-G, and join. Basic membership is $30 per year or whatever you can afford. A donation of any size will be greatly appreciated and will enable us to continue doing programs such as this with the able assistance of our program coordinator, Natasha Santos. And thank you, Natasha, for helping to make this program possible. You are also welcome to join our Israel-Palestine Committee, which meets at 7 p.m. on the first Monday of every month. Currently, we're on Zoom. Our next meeting will be Monday, July 6th. This weekend, we are supporting events sponsored both by the Movement for Black Lives, commemorating June 19th, and the Poor People's Campaign for a Moral Revival. Information about how you can participate is on our website, so please also check out our Facebook Twitter and Instagram, depending on which of those you use, invite your family and friends and help to spread the word. So thanks again for joining us tonight. And I will now turn the program back to Tom. Thank you, Charlotte. Now, just a few words about the USS Liberty before we hear from our first speaker. On June 8th, 1967, 53 years ago this month, the US Navy technical research ship USS Liberty was on an intelligence mission in the Eastern Mediterranean in international waters when it was savagely attacked by Israeli forces. It was a dark and hellish day in American history. 34 servicemen lost their lives and 173 were wounded in the sustained multi-pronged attack. That much is acknowledged by all sides. Less clear to those of us not there on that day is whether or not it could have been an accident, a case of mistaken identity, as claimed by the Israeli government, and whether the subsequent investigation was meant to reveal the truth of the matter. We have with us right now on Zoom three USS Liberty veterans. Phil Turney, stationed on deck at the time of the attack, who saw it all happen. Larry Bowen, who was working below deck as the torpedo exploded, and will relate that and the aftermath of the incident. And Ernie, Ernie Gallo, who was also on board, 
but will focus on the ongoing work the USS Liberty Veterans Association has been doing to have a more thorough investigation and to make this tragedy known to the American public. After we've heard from our three USS Liberty speakers, we will get to as many questions and comments as possible from those noted at the time of your registration and also from those entered in the chat section of this Zoom application. Please use the Zoom chat section to send us your questions. Brooklyn for Peace is pleased to present our first speaker of the evening, Phil Turney, a witness to the attack and a past president of the USS Liberty Veterans Association for many years. Phil. We should unmute Phil. Go ahead, uh, Phil, you're unmuted. You're, you're ready to go, Phil, go ahead, speak. Oh, okay, well, I, I didn't, you, uh, you went out, everything just went out, so I didn't know what was going on. Oh, sorry. But anyway, uh, yeah, my name is Phil Turney. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good, Phil. Okay, yeah. Uh, my name is Phil Turney. I was a third class uh, petty officer, ship fitter aboard the Liberty. Uh, I, I did welding and stuff like that, because I was also in damage control. But uh, that's where the story begins is early in the morning, we saw reconnaissance aircraft circling our ship. Uh, with the star of David on him. And it was a beautiful sunny day. Our flag was flying 1.5 miles up the coast of the Sinai. 12, 12 and a half knot wind going across the deck. The flag was flurling. It was perfect. Nobody could misidentify that ship. And uh, they did identify the ship as American. American and friendly. And then they forgot we were there. They took us off their war table and didn't let the other watch know that we were an American ship and there. That, that's a new one on me. But anyway, they, they circled our ship and looked at it, took pictures, I'm sure, for where they were going to strafe us and hit us and, and do what they did to us. And it's been... Uh, it's been a, li a lifelong dream for me ever since uh, this, this deal happened, this atrocity against mankind, not just aboard the USS Liberty, but all Americans. I just didn't get attacked that day. Neither of my shipmates, their families did, you did, everybody did. And unfortunately, 34 of my shipmates lost their lives that day, many of them my good friends. Uh, we went to general quarters about uh, a half hour, 45 minutes before the attack started. I was still on deck. I, I took my gear off. I damaged uh, my firefighting gear and uh, went back to my duty station. It took me about 30 seconds to get there. All of a sudden, uh, general quarters went off and uh, under attack and under attack, uh, we didn't know what was going on. Because we were only 12.5 miles off the coast, we've been identified. It had to be the Arabs. It had to be. Who else would, who else would cross that line? That that line you do not cross, and attack an American ship in international waters with our flag flying. With our flag flying. Anybody else cross that line? They'd get, they'd get what uh, Japanese got in World War II. But here they got off with nothing. They got off with nothing because our government is subservient to the Zionist state of Israel. 
That's just the truth. That's just the way it is. Everybody knows it. Look, this is what they did right here. There was 850 of these we cut out. They told us to quit cutting at 850. Over 5,000 armored piercing bullets in the ship. Napalm dropped on us. All of our communications taken out. And a 40 by 40 foot hole in the side of the ship after five torpedoes were shot at us. I, uh, I could go through a lot of sequences about the attack and this and that and the other, but the main, the main point that I want to get is that my 34 shipmates uh, that were killed that day, they aren't forgotten by any of us, especially by your two next guests, Larry and, and Ernie. I mean, these guys are lucky to be alive. They're down below the decks, man. I don't see how uh, anybody survived down there. I mean, but they did. Nine, nine of the people, other people were killed or were uh, on deck fighting fires or people I knew. And, uh, but the main goal is, is to get the truth out. And I thank you guys for doing that. Uh, we also got something else going on with uh, True News. I don't know if you ever heard of them, True News. They're doing a four and a half hour documentary film on the Liberty that will be coming out in the fall. And I think all you good people would be interested in that, very interested in it. So I just, uh, I don't know how much time I've taken up, but I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you got a lot of people that's coming up behind me, but, uh, the whole point of it is that nobody should be be allowed to get by with cold blood, cold blooded murder and get by with it. Not even Israel. And the only reason they got by with it is because our government was probably in collusion with them. Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, knew we were under attack and recalled the the aircraft. We called the jet aircraft. We got pilots. A 90 uh, a plus year old pilot in his 90s that was sent to help us and he, his testimony tells that they, they recalled us oh the, he said well what's going on what's what oh, we're up here let us go see no go back to base go back to base our own country left us out there to die 70 percent cash casualty rate So it's, uh, it's a tough pill to swallow. It should be a tough pill to swallow for all Americans. All we want is justice. We don't want anything more than that. We don't want money. We, we, we don't want anything. And Admiral Kidd ordered us never to talk about it, or we go to prison or worse. So it's, it's just been a tough deal for all of us. And it's not right. It shouldn't happen to anybody. I don't want it to happen to anybody else again. You know, uh, Admiral Moore, uh, one of our greatest supporters, one of the greatest men in the world, the Moore Report, uh, former chairman, Jesus, Joint Chiefs of Staff, a good friend, General Ray Davis, Medal of Honor recipient, uh, Rev. Admiral Merlin Starring, a great guy, a judge, Ambassador Ray Akins, I know all these guys. And they support us and they love us and we love them. But these great men would not do that if we weren't telling the truth. We have no, why would we lie? You either believe us or you believe those other guys or you believe the politicians. Phil, do you want yes. to tell us a little bit about how this all started? Uh, what, what the first, uh, Hit, hit on the ship was, that sort of thing's a little chronology. I'd be glad to, Tom. Uh, the, uh, there, were, there were two jets coming over the ship, and I, I didn't see this personally. Another shipmate of mine did, uh, Bill LeMay. Uh, he was up there with Stephen Toth. This is all in the film, too. I'm not giving nothing away. But uh, he said, sir, did you see that one went down? And the other one came straight down the middle of the ship and started strafing everything, live rafts, everything. 
men on deck. A, a friend of mine, he's dead now, Tom Riley, he had over 500 pieces of shrapnel in him. He was carrying a, a bucket of, of deck deck paint, gray. It was open and it, it sealed him up. And he lived. He lived because that paint sealed him up. It was so hot, it just, boom. That's the only thing that saved his life. But yeah, they were shooting anything that could come, anything, and over and over and over again. It was just unreal. Like I could say, it was 850 of these holes in there. Some this big, some that big. Uh, you know, it's, and then napalm burning us is up, burning us up. Okay, here come the torpedo boats. They, uh, they fire five torpedoes at us. One of hit the starboard side, picked the ship up. It was terrible. And I mean, and, uh, and all these CTs died, you know, and one little whack right there. I mean, it's just all these young men, man, didn't have a chance. Of life. We were trying to put over life rafts. We only have three left, three left, and they, they shot them out of the water. We were going to put our only remaining, the guys that were hurt the worst in there, and uh, they shot the life rafts up. How do you do that to a human being? But uh, we didn't see any help help until uh, the next morning, 18 hours, something like that away. And uh, help never came until 18 hours after that. We were all alone with a big hole in the ship. People dying and hurting all over the place it was a it was a mess i mean the mess that's just full of people everybody was hurting it was uh everybody just did what they could i'll tell you that some of the best men in the world i mean it was amazing to see with your own lives what these guys can do That's why I wrote two books, trying to uh, get justice. Yeah, I'm emotional, but I'm pissed off. But the people that did it and the people that covered it up, the people are still covering it up. They just want us all dead, die out. But none of us are going to quit till the last guy. So that's pretty much it. They fixed up the ship. I stayed with it. Made it look like brand new. Sent us back to the States like nothing ever happened. And uh, it wasn't a big fanfare or anything like that. But it was a tough go on the way, way back, believe me, for the guys that stayed. And uh, even that trip scarred a lot of people bringing her home. So I, th I guess I've taken up my time. Thank you so much, Phil. That's an incredible recount of that uh, horrendous day. Very painful to hear, but what we all need to know about. I really thank you for, for what you just said and uh, just sharing your pain as much as possible. Now, we're going to hear from Larry Bowen, who has just last week assumed the presidency of the USS Liberty Veterans Association. Larry. Thank you, Tom. I don't know if you can see me on the screen. I'm still seeing Phil, but. 
can you hear me on the screen? We can hear you, and you're you're in the center of the screen for everybody else. Go ahead. Okay. Um, as Phil said, the skipper had called a a general quarters drill prior to the attack. So all of us down in the communications section where, where I work and where the rest of the CTs work had just secured from that just prior to the, um, the actual general, general quarters that occurred at, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, once again, you would scramble from where you were at and go to your general quarter station. Some of the CTs would go to a damage control locker like where Phil was working out of. Um, others would go to other rooms within the uh, cryptologic spaces, uh, which is what I did. Prior to going to my general quarter station, I was sitting at a manual Morse position on a bulkhead right next to our comm center. Um, it's a manual Morse, we call that radio research number one, and I was copying international Morse code. Um, but when they sounded general quarters, my duty station, my general quarter station was one, one deck above. So I went one, one deck up and two other shipmates joined me in another room to continue doing the same, same job. We were part of that classified mission that Tom mentioned at the beginning. Um, and so we continued doing our mission work in that separate room. Um, when the first pass, when those jets came over, for those of us internal to the ship, it sounded like heavy chains being dragged across the ship. I mean, we, we didn't know it was strafing because you couldn't tell. We, the only way we could tell was that they were these 50 caliber armor piercing shells. They were sending tracer rounds through and the tracer rounds were coming through the skin of the ship, just like the 50 caliber rounds. And you'd see these little white flashes going by you as you're sitting there. And I mean, it would scare the daylights out of you just knowing that, at any second, one of those 50 caliber rounds might come through the equipment and, and kill you. Um, and as Phil mentioned, the, the strafing lasted probably a, probably a good half hour um, because there was strafing. And then there was another group of aircraft that came in to do the napalm. And some of our uh, CTs were part of a fire control team that had to go out and fight fires as well. That, that was part of their repair, repair function. Um, so internally there, we were all secure in our spaces. We had dogged down all the hatches, which are for people outside, that would be a door, and the scuttles, which is an opening inside that hatch, which is just a round opening that you could squeeze through. Um, and the people below us were secure down below. Uh, when, the, when the skipper sounded the alarm for um, prepare for torpedo attack, we had no idea what to expect. We'd never been through anything like that. The guys in the room with me, um, we just sat on the deck, braced ourselves against the bulkhead, and, and waited to meet our maker. Um, we were all praying and, and hoping that we made it out alive. When the torpedo hit, it hit right beneath where we were at, and it immediately propelled us to the overhead. We all got minor concussions from that. We dropped back on the deck, and all of the equipment that had been in the racks had been blown out of the racks. Most of us had cuts, abrasions, and, and everything, but, but you didn't have time to even consider that because we had all of our shipmates down below that needed to get out of that flooded compartment. So we scrambled out of that, that room that we were in to get out, open up the scuttle to start letting people out, 
the water was already coming in from that, that 30 by 40 foot hole in the starboard side where the torpedo had come in. And uh, the scuttle wasn't going to let the, the people out quick enough. So we had to get the, the hatch open. Got the hatch open, um, and people started scrambling out, getting their life, life vests, and, and going to the uh, casualty collection stations. Those that could make it on their own were making it on their own. Those that couldn't were helping other shipmates to, to get them to mess decks, which is where we had our primary collection station. Every table in our mess decks had a, a mattress on it and had a body on it where, where our seriously wounded were, were being treated. And anyone who knew anything at all about medicine or triage was there trying to help our, our two corpsmen and the one uh, medical officer that we had on board. Um, it was, I mean, as Phil said, everybody was trying to take care of everybody else. If you could help, you helped. And uh, everything inside was, was bottled up. It smelled from the, um, the fumes from the burning outside the, and it smelled from burning inside. Part of what we do as CTs or cryptologic technicians, when you think you're gonna be overtaken by hostile forces, you're required to do emergency destruction. That means that you have to destroy your equipment that's on board. You have to destroy any classified documents that are on board so that they don't fall into the hands of any potential um, hostile force. Um, so part of that was being done before the torpedo hit. Obviously, after the torpedo hit, everybody was more concerned with you know, getting out alive. And when that torpedo hit, um, 25 of of our crew members, of our shipmates, died instantly. Uh, as Phil mentioned, nine of his, you know, our shipmates that had been topside were killed by hostile fire from the aircraft, um, and the other 25 were were CTs that were down in that, um, you know, classified compartment, and it's. It is a wonder that anybody got out of there alive. Uh, there's, there's not a day that goes by that, that you don't think about that and, and kind of ask, why me? Why, why wasn't I one of them? I, I lost a very good friend down there. He was a 23 year, 23 year old Jewish man that was due to get out of the service in August. He was on his last cruise. And um, unfortunately, he he lost his life that day. Um, and you know, the Navy um, the Navy couldn't have cared less. I wanted to take I wanted to escort the body back home so I could tell his mom and dad and his sister uh, that he died instantly. But the Navy wouldn't let me do that. Um, one of the things that Phil didn't talk about was that they conducted a, a court of inquiry, a Navy court of inquiry on board the ship. And that court of inquiry, normally, you know, you would conduct a, an investigation that would take months to, to investigate all, everything that happened, everything that happened working up to it and, and the aftermath. This was a seven day court of inquiry they only interviewed 14 members of the crew and determined that um, Israel said it was a mistaken identity. We'll accept that. And they tailored the 14 crew members' testimony to fit that court's findings, that it was a mistaken identity. If there was something in their testimony that didn't go along with that finding, they just uh, deleted it from the testimony. And we've got a sworn affidavit David, from um, one of the admirals that, that said he knows for a fact that they took 
words out of the, the sworn testimony um, because Lieutenant Lloyd Painter had had talked about them strafing the uh, the life rafts that Phil talked about that we were going to uh, offload some of our seriously wounded uh, casualties into when we were going to abandon ship or thought we were going to have to abandon ship. Um, that was nowhere in any of the, the reporting. So, um, and uh, they, they did tell us, Admiral Kidd came on board and, and told us all that uh, we were never to talk about uh, what happened um, or we would be imprisoned or fined or, or worse. Um, and, and I made a career out of the Navy. So I, I never said anything for, for years. I mean, I think it was 2008 or 2009 before I ever said anything. So um, and I'm, and I'm still, I mean, this is unusual, I guess, for me to be talking about it this openly. Um, but it's, it's time. I mean, we've, we've waited 53 years to get the truth out to the American public. And I mean, our own government abandoned us when we were under fire. I feel betrayed by our government. Um, we think that, uh, or I, I certainly believe that, that Johnson knew exact, knew exactly what, um, what was going on over there because when we sent out our SOS message um, and said that we were under attack and they scrambled jets from the sixth fleet, McNamara recalled them and they, they sent another set of aircraft out that are reconfigured with conventional aircraft um, and again notified the White House that they had done that. McNamara again got on the line and said, I told you to recall those jets Admiral Geist got on the phone and said, it's my prerogative. I want it from higher authority. Lyndon Johnson got on the line and says, I don't care if that ship and everybody on board goes to the bottom of the Mediterranean. I'm not going to under our an ally. Um, we didn't know who had done the attacking. We hadn't reported that to anyone. So we, the crew, have been asking ourselves for 53 years, how did Johnson already know that Israel was the one that was doing the attacking, unless he knew in advance that they were going to be doing the attacking. There's, um, there's a lot of questions out there that we'd like to get answers for. And I think I've probably taken up most of my 10 minutes. Uh, so. Larry, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, very, very hard to hear this story, to think that this could happen to servicemen serving their country and uh, the pain that you've experienced and that pain, 53 years of pain from having it denied. Uh, just thank you so much for bringing it to, to our attention. Um, uh, now for our final speaker of the evening, we're gonna have uh, Ernie Gallo who has just last week stepped down as president of the USS Liberty Veterans Association. Ernie. Good afternoon. Um, if you haven't gotten heartburn yet, I'm here to put the frosting on the cake. I'm here to tell you what we've experienced over these 53 years, and it's not a pretty picture. Um, I just I want to start out by saying that in some circles, we're labeled anti-Semitic, we're labeled troublemakers, whiners. Our mission statement is simply to have the truth told about the attack. And the United States government in Israel has lied to the American public about the attack. It was not an accident. And we have proof that would stand up in a court of law that the attack was definitely um, either uh, that, that it was deliberate. Uh, and we think that LBJ colluded with the Israelis to sink the ship. And keep in and uh, keep in mind when the Israelis used the torpedo, they were attempting to sink the ship. 
and it's only miraculous that the ship did not sink. And I, and I emphasize the word miraculous. We believe that the hand of God was there to prevent us from going down. And for us to tell this story in its entirety. I've been to over 45 countries in my lifetime, and it doesn't get any better than here in the United States with all its problems, with all its foibles. It is the best thing going. And <clears> that <throat> it's being threatened. Um, and these, the, the, the Liberty incident is a great example of why it's being threatened. Um, so I just want to get that off my chest that uh, uh, you're, you're looking at loyal Americans here who just want to see justice served, especially for the 34 that were, were murdered. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the Navy Court of Inquiry a little bit more um, than uh, what Larry has um, indicated. It's obstruction of justice at the highest level. The um, Admiral McCain, who is the um, in charge of, uh, who, who worked in London, and uh, he was in charge for all Navy activities on that side of the earth. Admiral Kidd, who was the president of the Navy Court of Inquiry, worked for Admiral Kidd. And so therefore, Admiral McCain, the father of, of Senator McCain, had had to be told, had been told by the White House that, that the Court of Inquiry was to come to the conclusion that the attack was accidental. That was a given. So they went about doing a function of taking testimony. And, and what's very important in what Larry said, that Lloyd Painter, one of our officers, Lloyd, Lloyd Painter, saw the Israelis machine gunning our life rafts. That's a violation against the Geneva Convention. That's important and I'll come up, I'll bring that up later. The legal counsel for that for the uh, Navy Court of Inquiry was uh, Captain Ward Boston. Um, he stayed quiet as well as kid for um, up until 2003, December 2003. Uh, and because of a series of events, Boston came out of the closet and gave us a sworn testimony. And I'll talk about that later. Um, it's also very important. The Navy Court of Inquiry was brought to London to be reviewed by Admiral McCain before it was approved and sent back to Washington. His legal counsel was then Captain uh, Merlin Starry. He eventually became the Navy Advocate General from 73 to 75. Captain Starring reviewed the Navy Court of Inquiry um, per his duties and was having problems with the document and indicated uh, at one point that um, the evidence given was, wasn't supporting the conclusion that the, ex that the attack was accidental. When, when Admiral McCain heard that, he had the report taken from him. Uh, in other words, Merlin Starring was, was supposed to approve it by signing it, and that did not happen. Very unusual. And McCain signed it and sent it back to Washington. And it was further modified by two, two individuals from the White House to, to whitewash this entire event. Why would our government go through all of that? What was so important about the Navy Court of Inquiry? And why would they go to the, that extent to make sure the, that the attack was labeled as accidental? Now I'm going to go through events that occurred. I'm trying to keep it chronological. 
when anyone graduates graduates from the uh, uh, Annapolis, the Navy, uh, 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 anyway, uh, there, there's a, a there's a place called Bancraft Hall, uh, a wall that's a, a memorial honor wall that anyone who graduates from the the, the academy uh, name is placed if they were killed in action. Our, our um, um, executive officer, Phil Armstrong, and another officer, Stephen Toth, both graduates, their names were not gonna be placed on the wall because the attack was accidental. Well, as Phil mentioned, uh, Admiral Moore, um, who was the CNO of the Navy at the time, um, made sure that 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 didn't that the names were placed on Bancroft Hall, and that any medals that were due to the be awarded to the ship uh, were given. So the first thing that happens is our captain is awarded the Medal of Honor. Now, the Medal of Honor, as you know, is historically given to uh, by the president to the individual at the White House. That did not happen. Captain McGonagall, our skipper, was given his medal at the Washington Navy Yard at a low level ceremony by the Secretary of the Navy. So why did LBJ do that? What was the harm in providing our captain with the Medal of Honor at the White House? And why was the press kept away from that? Now, the House of Representatives has a mandate from our Constitution, specifically Article 1, Section 8, where they have to investigate any ship that's attacked Excuse, excuse me, any naval ship that's attacked in peacetime. Um, it goes back to the, the days of the, the piracy days. And they have done so for every naval attack that's occurred except for one, USS Liberty. Our Congress, when they hear USS Liberty, hide under their desks. They are are extremely fearful of getting involved and call and, and, and providing the investigation that's demanded of them. They have not done so. As a matter of fact, Congress has not investigated the 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 uh, uh, attack whatsoever. They, none of the crew have ever been uh, given uh, subpoenas to come in and give a a, a sworn testimony to them. That has never happened. And our detract detractors will tell you that, oh, there's been 11 investigations. There might have been some closed door conferences about the Liberty, but there's never been an official investigation. Now, um, in January of 2006, the Department of State called a conference to discuss the Six Day War except they were lying through their teeth. They, what they really wanted to talk about was to once and for all put a lid on and on our, the crew, telling the story that the attack was deliberate. They asked uh, historians from the CIA and from the State Department uh, to give their, their uh, to provide information they also invented, invited three Israeli journalists, an American journalist, Jay Crystal, and Jim Bamford. So everyone except for Jim Bamford talked how, how the Israelis were, were the fog of war, it was a mistake, and it was all, all the excuses that they could come up with. Um, to explain away why the attack why, why the attack occurred. When um, Jim Bamford 
was asked to give his his uh, testimony. He read Baud, the 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 document that Captain Ward Boston just provided us, which was um, an explanation uh, a, a, the, the the conclusion of of the private conclusions of both Admiral Kidd and him that the attack was definitely uh, deliberate and they were very upset about it. Uh, but they, as I said, they, they did their duty and, and kept it under, under lit, uh, quiet for uh, till 2003. Now, about the same time, the Navy was looking at creating a new ship called the Littoral Combat Ship, Combat Ship. Abbreviations LCS, littoral combat ship. And the Navy Times indicated the planning, uh, what the, the plans were being created, that the naming convention of these ships were going to be patriotic names. So, um, the LCS-1 is what, what is still is, is called the USS Freedom today, LCS-1, USS Freedom. LCS-2 was supposed to be named USS Liberty. That lasted two months and all of a sudden the game plan changed. Naming the ship USS Liberty would bring too much attention to the attack of June 8th, 1967. So that could not be. So they changed the whole, the whole, con the, the naming convention. Keeping in mind, or if you don't know, that the USS Liberty is the most decorated naval ship for a single engagement of all time. The medals that were awarded, one medal of honor, two Navy crosses, 12 silver stars, 26 bronze stars, 208 purple hearts, the presidential unit citation, and more. And the Navy can't name the ship USS Liberty, nor would they even entertain uh, naming a ship the William McGonagall, his Medal of Honor recipient. Why? Why is it so important to keep this lie alive now, 53 years later? June 8th, 2005, the USS Liberty Veterans Association submitted an official war crimes report to the Pentagon. No need to investigate, the Pentagon told us, because the Navy Court of Inquiry did the investigation. So the rights of 291 sailors, I should say, um, sailors and Marines, considering the Uniform Code of Military Justice, our rights have been trashed. Why? Why continue the lie and the deception? All right. Now, yes. Uh, we're running short of time. I could listen to you for many hours more, but I wonder if we could uh, go to the uh, questions and if you'd like to just wrap it up in a, in a minute or so, if you can. Sure, okay. I just want to mention that Merlin Starring and Colonel Barrett Taylor, Air Force lawyer, were friends of Senator John uh, Warner. And they wrote to him and asked, them to, and asked him to please look into the Liberty attack. So he had the, the uh, uh, he, was set, he was the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and he had their lawyers ask us, not under subpoena, just 
just come to the the Rayburn building and and talk to them about the the, the attack. So um, Admiral Starring and Colonel Barrett Taylor and a bunch of us went to the Rayburn Rayburn building. And we gave them all the information we had. Um, they were concentrating on what didn't the Navy Court of Inquiry find. So we let it let them know in uncertain terms that the attack was delivered. When this information was passed to Senator Warner, this is a well, I want to bring it up because it's kind of typical. Senator Warner said, Well, I'm one senator of many. So, you know, I won't be able to do anything for these guys. But more importantly, the reason they were, the uh, senators, uh, I mean, uh, Starring and, and, and Taylor were, were friends was uh, that the Senator Warner was Secretary of the Navy a few years earlier. And the second part of what he said was re really important, that he had friends in place and he felt that if he did anything to help the Liberty, that these people would feel like he was, they were st stabbing him in the back, stabbing them in the back. So that's the, the collusion that's taking place within our government um, to, to keep this, um, this deceit, deceit and deception from the American public. Why? And I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Ernie. Very hard stories to hear, and I'm so pleased I could be here tonight to, to hear all of you. Um, thank you to all our speakers for this very important information. We will now turn the meeting over to Don Bickford, also a member of Brooklyn for Peace and its Israel-Palestine Committee, who will read questions submitted with answers to be provided by our three speakers. I don't know how many questions we have, but uh, if you still would like to submit a, a question in the chat section, uh, Don may be able to get to it. Thank you. Thank now, you, Tom, and, and, and thank you, uh, Ernie and Larry and Phil. Uh, let me start with a pair of questions that are pretty closely connected. Um, what exactly was the mission of the Liberty on that day? And did the Israeli government have anything to fear uh, from that mission? Um, Larry, you want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that. The, um, the mission, there's, there's two missions. There's the one for publication, which is we were sent over there as a... Um, as a ship to monitor what was going on and provide communication support for our embassy personnel. And in the event that we might have to evacuate those personnel, um, our ship was there to, to help evacuate them. Um, that's the official mission for our being there. However, since we're a intelligence collection ship, and this, um, the CTs, you know, having linguists on board um, and having a collection mission, um, we were also there monitoring the, the activity going on in the Six Day War so that we could keep our uh, seniors back in Washington apprised of exactly what was going on from a, from a hostility standpoint in the event that the U.S. needed to advise Israel um, to tone it down or whatever. You know, I mean, Israel was our only ally over there. Egypt had um, Soviet support. So there was um, concern there that if things escalated, Israel certainly wanted to have the U.S. Um, backing them up. So there was a, a dual purpose. And, and what did Israel have to fear from that mission? Uh, Israel was concerned that we were monitoring their communications 
and would relay back to the United States that they weren't playing according to plan. Um, Israel was not supposed to be the aggressor. They were not supposed to be um, initiating any of the offensive. So unless Egypt came across and started attacking Israel was supposed to just hold fast. Um, and Israel was monitoring our communications and probably knew that we knew exactly who initiated the, the hostilities over there. And they probably had contacted Washington and told Washington to either get us out of there or they would get us out of there. Thank you. Uh, what made you break your silence about the attack? Did any of you suffer any repercussions from the government or the Navy for speaking out? Um, I was probably the last one of the three of us to break my silence. So I don't know, either Ernie or Phil might be a better one to ask that. I, I broke my silence after I stopped working for the government, which was not until 2008. Yeah, uh, the, uh, we, we basically did keep, uh, we, we, we were ordered not to, not to talk about it, and uh, uh, most of us did not. Uh, our division officer, uh, J James Ennis, wrote a book called Assault on the Liberty. And the book was published in 1979. So with a book being published, and he, and he gives details, extreme details, great details about what happened to the ship, then the word began to spread hey, that since his book got published, that, hey, we can now start talking. So we first start talking to each other and comparing notes. Um, and, and a good example of that is I did not, I did not know, as, as, and I, I don't think anybody else did, until our 20th anniversary that the planes were recalled until uh, Commander Lewis told us uh, the story about that, and um, and f from there, um, one thing led to another, and people began to ask questions, and we began began to give uh, our truthful and honest answers. Um, I might add. Uh, Go ahead. I just uh, I just wanted to add one thing. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, when I learned about it, I learned about it from Chief Master Chief Stan White, a communications technician. He wrote an article. I saw it in the Rocky Mountain News. I almost fell over when I read it. I. I felt like the whole weight of my show, the earth just came off my shoulders when I read that. I said, man, if he can start talking, I'm going to start talking. And from that moment on, that's what I've been doing is trying to get this, get the story out. But yeah, it's, uh, it's frustrating, but look at, look what you guys are doing. You're helping us out and it's much appreciated. Thanks. Can you um, tell us if there's been any uh, activism on the part of close relatives of the 34 sailors who died? Uh, well, well I, I can think of one, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Phil. No, uh, yeah, I, I, can, I think uh, one real activist is, uh, 
is uh, Lieutenant Toss father. He was a retired captain in the United States Navy. And when he found out what happened to his son and he couldn't find out anything about it, every door he opened it, they slammed in his face and he retired captain. He started smoking again. Uh, it wasn't two or three years later after that, he was a dead man. When his son died, he died. And it affects everybody. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible thing, but uh, that's the way it worked out. And it hurt a lot of families. That's the bad news. It just hurt so many families. You know, I, was I guess it, mention, that's about it for me. I was going to mention that uh, uh, Lieutenant Scott's son, um, who was a Harvard uh, educator, wrote a book entitled Attack on the Liberty. And uh, very well done. Um, and um, a tribute to his father. Um, that's, uh, I don't know of any other activisms uh, from, uh, or more than that. So one question that just came in on the chat, uh, what does justice for the USS Liberty look like to each of you? What would you like to see happen now? I would like our government to completely tell the honest story about what happened to us in detail and let the, let the um, things fall as they, you know, the complete truth. Um, uh, um, that's all I'm, I'm the, the Liberty story is so important to America in many different levels. You know, we're not, we're not here to, to, un, un, uh, to uh, see Israel wiped off the earth or anything like that. Um, we just want the simple truth told about what happened to the Liberty. But with that said, there are many things that then need to be looked at uh, in its entirety. For instance, if LBJ did give the order to Admiral Kidd, I mean, excuse me, Admiral McCain, and indirectly to Admiral McKidd and also Admiral, uh, Admiral Martin, who was the Sixth Fleet um, commander, but he, gave, gave the, he gave the order that he wanted the, the ship sunk or that the Israelis were going to sink the ship. They're complicit, but now if, if they're a good officer, there's a thing called the Uniform Code of Military Justice. They would know that at, that's a bad order. So even today, if the commander in chief tells uh, a, an admiral or general to do something that goes against the Uniform Code of Military Justice and they refuse, their career is over. And they can be fired on the spot. So there's no recourse for them. That needs to change. They, there needs to be accountability there when someone is, 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 is attempting to uh, uh, you know, go against the, the, the new Uniform Code of Military Justice. Okay, thank you. A couple questions I'll read together, somewhat related, and, and you can deal with them in any sequence. Did Israel prosecute those involved in the attack? They said they would. Was there coverage in either the Washington Post or the New York Times? Were any of the crew uh, interviewed by journalists? Uh, I guess I could take part of that, or maybe even all of it. Uh, Israel did not prosecute. There was one, um, one airman who... The story that we've heard is that he said um, it's an American ship. You know, he was reporting back to the ground controller and they said, follow orders, hit the target. He says, but I see the flag. It's an American ship. And again, the ground controller told him, follow your orders, hit the target. Um, so that's before any shots were fired. Um, and 
we've been told that that one pilot refused and, and flew back to base, um, but he was never prosecuted. Um, initially, there were articles in, I'm sure, the Washington Post, probably the New York Times, for like the first day or two that um, misquoted the number of injuries and deaths. I think uh, Johnson was saying there were only 10 uh, deaths and I don't know, I'm not sure how many injured they came up with, but uh, considerably less than 70% of the crew had been either killed or injured. Um, so, and then within, within a week to 10 days, they, they took it off off the air. They, they just said no more coverage. So everything was was hushed up. Uh, so that was that was the last that we heard about any coverage at all at uh, you know and for the rest of us, you know we we were never interviewed by media. Um, I don't know of because we were told not to. We were told not to speak. That was even yeah. before we got in a multi. But I can. Go ahead. I, Go ahead. I can add to that. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, when we when we were in Malta, uh, I don't know if you guys were still there or not. Uh, they probably got you off pretty quick. They got all the CTs off so they could spread them around the world so they couldn't talk. Pretty smart people, but. Uh, uh, as we got into Malta and, and things, you know, we got the ship secure and all that stuff and uh, all the body recovery was done. And, and I think the CTs, they start taking them off then for, because they're the only ones that can really go down there. There was a few guys that went there, down there, like Jim Smith, good, good friend of mine, uh, shipmate. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Lieutenant George Golden, he was my division officer. Uh, he, he, I worked for him for, well, for over three years, right at three years, but uh, he got on the beach and, uh, and uh, we were, we were, uh, we were talking and uh, we were just in a small gathering at a bar, uh, having a couple of beers and uh, George said something in this, in this guy uh, gigged him and said, Hey man, you're not supposed to be talking, you're not supposed to be talking to anybody. So uh, they were watching us, and uh, I guess they didn't trust us too much. But uh, it works both ways. I don't trust them too much either. But that that's that's a story that we all knew, and and what was going on. And yeah, they were watching us. See, see if we could say something. But most of the guys just wanted to go home, man. And uh, that was about it. Yeah, Don. One sure. of the one of the things that um, I didn't bring up uh, during my discussion, but Phil just mentioned it briefly about the body recovery, and it was probably one of the most gruesome parts of this whole um, incident for for us CTs. Um, we were the only ones with the clearances that could go down into those flooded compartments where our twenty five shipmates had been uh, kind of in the water for the past six or seven days that we were in transit to Malta. So um, Ron Kukul was our um, leading petty officer in charge of the body recovery. Um, I was one of the first ones to go down in there um, for body recovery because I wanted to find out what happened to my buddy, Bob Eisenberg. Um, he was the third body that I recovered, but here you are finding your shipmates in pieces, not, not whole bodies. We're talking limbs and, and, you know, trying to put body parts together and, and Ron, you know, we would take body parts to Ron and he would have to try and put, you know, a torso and a leg and a, an arm or whatever. And, and it was, 
these these are the kinds of memories that that a lot of us still have. The nightmares that you've lived with for 53 years will live with for the rest of our lives, and um, you know you just you, you just can't imagine living through that. Um, you, you thank God that you were one of the fortunate ones and you're still here to talk about it. But it, it's just, um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I probably didn't talk about it before because it is such a painful memory. But I, I think it's important to bring it up. Thank you. Ron? Ron? Yeah. Yes, Ron? go ahead, Phil. Uh, Larry mentioned that Ron Kukul. Ron Kukul is actually on on right now. I can see him um, as one of the members. He's here. Hello, Ron. Um, let me go on with one more question. Um, has there been any outreach from the Liberty Veterans Association to the very few, mostly new members of Congress who have been beginning to show some willingness to question the actions of the Netanyahu government. Let me take that one right quick. Uh, uh, I don't care who's in office. It doesn't make any difference, Don. Uh, and that's the way it's been forever. Because if you're gonna get elected to this, this uh, Congress or Senate, or become anything in, in, in the government, you better get a stamp of approval from uh, somebody else besides this government. And uh, you don't get elected if, if you go against Israel. I've seen good congressmen go down. Paul Finley, Pete McCluskey, uh, Adlai Stevenson. They, they, they just stole the, him becoming uh, governor of Illinois because of his resistance towards Israel. Jim Trafficant, uh, on and on and on, these guys. So yeah, uh, I, I've said this for years, they're bought and paid for, all of them. Follow the money and uh, that's where it goes. And I don't think that's just my personal opinion. I think a lot of people share that. Uh, who was the... Uh highest ranking official, military or governmental, to ever listen to your story and attempt to help? Uh, I would say Devin Nunes uh, from California. He actually got um, Terry Halbarger, um, the Silver Star, um, what, 40 some years after the Liberty incident, Terry was the, uh, the man who took coax cable and, uh, ran it to a, uh, an antenna that hadn't been working for a couple of cruises. And he, he did that while we were still under attack and jets were firing. Terry was wounded during that, uh, an attempt to get the coax out there, but he spliced coax cable together and uh, and got that antenna working. And that's the only way we got our SOS signal out to the USS Saratoga. And uh, it was Devin Nunes, uh, Congressman Nunes. And I actually talked with him. Uh, I gave him a copy of our book. I gave him one of our Liberty Challenge coins. Um, but I've tried unsuccessfully to have him introduce into Congress um, a resolution to get recognition for our 34 fallen shipmates. You know, we've been trying to get uh, some kind of recognition for these, these men who paid the ultimate sacrifice and have not been honored in any way by our government. Um, I was hoping maybe he could just do a USS Liberty Remembrance Day. Uh, that would be a small token of appreciation, but I wasn't, wasn't looking for it for just one June 8th. I was looking for it as, you know, forever. Um, that would, 
maybe um, help some of the crew members who lost uh, or some of the families who lost sons or fathers um, feel like they're not totally forgotten. Uh, it doesn't cost Congress anything at all to name a day for, for something like that. Uh, there's no monetary, you know, cost for that. But uh, so far, it's kind of fallen on deaf ears. I've, I do have resolutions in Congress right now with uh, a congressman from New York, and I'm willing to put them in, you know, every state in the union. I've got them made up. Uh, I did it uh, I, two years ago when I went to the VFW National Convention, uh, trying to get the same thing done, uh, just asking veterans to hand them out to their representatives in their local states. And unfortunately, I don't know where they ended up. But if, if anyone's listening and they want to, they're willing to present one to one of their local representatives in their states, I'll be more than happy to send them a copy. And, and you said one New York State uh, member of Congress has it? Yeah, Tom, Senator, uh, Congressman Tom Reed. Um, he's from upstate New York. Um, I actually was in his office back in March. Uh, I live here in Maryland, so it's it's not hard for me to get down there and knock on doors and, and try and make our voices heard. But it's, you know, with this COVID-19, it's been a little difficult because, you know, they're not always in town. But this was during the uh, National Commanders um, Conference on the Hill in early March. It was March 8th through the 11th. And the American Legion National Commander was in doing his briefing to Congress. And I was in doing my briefing to congressmen and senators uh, behind closed doors. So most of it was staff members, but uh, you know, I actually got to talk to Congressman Green, so. Okay. We're nearing the end of our um, allotted time. And I wonder if uh, each of the uh, three veterans want to make any final comments and I'll be turning it back over to uh, to Tom. Well, I just want to add, if, um, if you've heard something that you do not believe, please do your own investigation. And a good source of information is at our website, uh, www.usslibertyveteransassociation.org. And um, there's links to other other sites that, and, and books that are out there. Um, uh, Phil's written a book, a uh, couple books. I've written, also, I've written one. Um, and um, we're trying, we're tr trying our darndest to get the word out. Um, and uh, we live in a wonderful country, like I said, and we, and it needs it needs to get in back to the way I like to put it to to you know we came out of World War II as a liberator nation, and we need to get back to that kind of uh, 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 that kind of uh, thinking uh, values. Um, and that's all. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, okay, let me. Uh, let me jump in there if you don't mind, Don. Sure. Uh, first of all, again, thank thank you all. Uh, you're so kind. And uh, I appreciate it so much, Kennedy. But I'll, I'll never be satisfied, uh, Don, until our government, uh, as Ernie said, you know, fesses up and t tells us exactly what went on and why and why they've covered it up. The cover-up is worse than the crime, and then uh, secondly, I, I don't I I want the people that did this, that committed the war crimes of shooting helpless sailors, shooting life rafts out of the water, dropping napalm on us, uh, any other uh, uh, despicable thing you could do to a human being, 
they did it that day. I want those war criminals to be prosecuted just like they did in Germany. Was not the Nuremberg trials? They tried the Nazis for uh, atrocities and war crimes, and they, they killed them. And there's no there's nobody that can escape a war crime. What's good for one is good for the other. Then I'll be satisfied. Uh, if this country wants to bow down to another nation, uh, we're not the America that I grew up in. So I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tom, do you want to uh, close it? Yes, uh, thank you, Don, and thank you to our USS Liberty speakers uh, for giving a real inside view of uh, something that uh, so few Americans know about. And I wonder if we uh, could try this to have some informal discussion for a bit longer that the program is now ending, but uh, we don't all have to go off uh, of this Zoom meeting at the same moment. Uh, so let's try that. Brooklyn for Peace is greatly appreciative of our three USS Liberty speakers, and we hope to remain in close contact. Uh, so thank you everyone for a very informative evening. And now uh, those of you who care to just, just stay along uh, around a little longer and we'll We'll see if we can't get a, a real uh, informal conversation going. Thank you, everybody. Maybe we should try to get uh, Ron to say something, if he's willing, our other veteran who's, who's here with us. Is he still there? Let's see if he is. He's here. I just asked him to unmute. Oh, there we go. Uh, how are you, Tom? Go ahead, Ron. Okay. Um, well, I was going to keep quiet today, pretty passive if I could have. But uh, I was just remarking to Tom, now, the cross above my head is an accident. Wasn't meant to be there. I just accidentally sat in front of it for some reason before this thing started. So my reasoning about all this thing, the whole thing, the, the attack, why we're still here, comes from right above my head here. It was because of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, we are still here. Divine intervention is the only thing that saved the liberty from going to the bottom. That's about all I can say right now because I wasn't ready to say anything, but uh, there were a lot of miracles that took, uh, took uh, place that day. Uh, some that I'm not even aware of, but uh, uh, myself, uh, I don't really want to go into it right now because I think Tom was planning on something later on on this. I'm not really sure, but um, it's the power of God. We're only here because of it. Do I have any disagreement? <laughs> Thank you so much, Ron. Um, we don't have any other veterans with us, do we? I don't think so. Uh, okay, so we could... Uh, we do have one. We do have... Uh, uh, hello, my name is Michael Atkinson. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry I'm late. My schedule didn't allow for me to join at the beginning, but I wanted to check this out. I am 49 years old. I'm a U.S. Army Corps of Engineer veteran. Um, I, I discovered the USS Liberty uh, massacre uh, scam years ago, and I wound up at the USS Liberty Facebook page, and here I am. I just wanted to ask about something I posted in the chat. Um, I don't know how often lawyers try to sue Netanyahu and, and prominent Americans, but I, I've got a link to a video I discovered. There's a lawyer trying to do that. And I wondered, could someone like that help you guys or, or not? Yeah, we've actually, 
discuss that amongst ourselves. There's a new law out that uh, the allows Americans to um, to sue countries that that are receiving um, financial aid from the United States if those countries are engaged in any kind of uh, I guess hostile activity against the United States or our allies. Well, it's an ally that was against us. Um, the problem that we've got, Michael, is that when we've talked to some of these law firms and that they all want money. Uh, we're a 501c3, so we don't have money. And uh, it's, if, if we could get something pro bono to just have them look at it or something, that would be different. Uh, but I think we're not, we're not after money for, we're after a full, you know, investigation into the, the whole incident and exactly what happened. And we've, we've got a pretty good idea that, the United States, LBJ, was, you know, collaborating with Israel to, to use us as a sacrificial lamb and, and sink us over there so that, so that Johnson could get rid of Nasser and, um, and Israel could gain the promised land over there in the Golan Heights and Lebanon and Syria and, you know, the whole area that they... So, uh, okay, I was just wondering because when I seen this forty minute video of this lawyer talking about what he's talking about, I just it just immediately wanted you know made me want to at least post it to you guys to see it. I just say thank you. Okay, yeah, I'll, I see the link, so I can uh, I can check it out and see what uh, you know we can look at it. And I also wanted to tell you guys that I spread the news of the USS Liberty all I can everywhere. And, and I email it, it, it all the, not all the time, but I, I, I do it consistently throughout the year. And, and that's just what I do. I'm supporting, I'm behind you 100%. And I, I also think if none of you have seen that, that documentary about the Israeli lobby that came out last year, um, it's really good to watch it and share it. Um, I mean, I've shared it before in the USS Liberty group. Um, and to me, it's just astounding. It's supposed to be this undercover documentary, if you haven't seen it, where they have hidden cameras and all that. I mean, if you haven't seen it, it's, 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 it appears to be genuine to me, and I share it all I can. Yeah. Uh, I I don't recall seeing it, but I'll uh, I'll have to look look at it and see. Uh, okay, okay. It's a four part uh, documentary put out by Al Jazeera a oh, couple okay. of years ago, yeah. and it's it's very informative. We have another survivor on here. Another survivor, Jack Horn, is on here. Oh. Jack, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I could definitely. Uh, I was a CT on board the Liberty down in the lower spaces where the torpedo struck and went through it all like the rest of you guys. But just to let you know, I am here and continuing to monitor your progress in this attempt to uh, get this injustice, injustice rather, uh, corrected. Well, maybe we've uh, we've come to the time where uh, people are getting tired or hungry. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, if there are no more questions, I just think uh, we all owe a, a great uh, debt. Uh, I'd, I'd offer uh, great thanks to our speakers tonight and all these veterans who've uh, endured that terrible day and and the 53 years since of uh, denial and and lies and uh, 
just very much like to stay in touch and, and have another program. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom, for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen, for all that you're doing. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Appreciate it very much. Mr. Gallo, it's nice to see you. Oh, before you go off, Deborah Thanks, Rosario Tom. says that she has a question. Okay. A question, too. Um, Hello? Okay. Can you hear me? That's a question. Hello? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Form a coalition. Deborah, what's your question? Deborah, I can just ask oh, a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. What's your question? Oh, okay, I just wanted to know um, why can um, um, is it possible you could find um, build a coalition with all the groups? Like I, I put like Black Lives Matter, right? They want to um, stop the militarization of the police and stop the uh, the Israelis from training a lot of the police. And I mean the. That knee on the neck was something that the Israelis do to the Palestinians. Um, um, is there any way you could form um, a, a coalition with all the groups um, to stop the Israeli lobby? Because that's what you really need to do: is stop the Israeli lobby from um, from influence in influence the uh, um, the, uh, the American politicians. Good luck with that. That ain't never gonna happen. Uh, yeah. right. as far as I'm concerned uh, no it's just the way it is uh, in this world and uh, nothing we could do about it if they were gonna, if, listen if they didn't do anything to Israel or anybody else for what they did to all of us well, there was uh, a, there was a we were dead men to them when we left port there was a group in um that stopped the uh, the police in um, in North Carolina, Durham, Carolina, from being trained from the IDF. So I think I think now people, because of the internet, right? People are more aware of what's going on in Israel and Palestine. And I think this is the time to form um, coalitions um, to defeat the Israeli lobby. That, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the core I issue here. Because unless you defeat this, uh, unless you do, um, the, the Israel Israeli lobby has strength, nothing at all is going to be um, uh, done, whether it's recognition of, of the uh, wrong that was due to the US liberty or um, uh, training of the militarized of the American, American police or um, all the money that we give to Israel. I mean, I, I think that's, this, this is the time to form some um, coalitions. And, um, and um, so is anyone in your group reaching out to like different groups and say, hey, we Thank you, thank you, Deborah. There's so many uh, ways uh, that we can work and, and coalition building is, is, is vitally important. And, one of the big ones right now is uh, Black Lives Matter has uh, also uh, endorsed uh, efforts to bring uh, justice in, in Palestine. So uh, we're going to see more of that, and every one of us can get involved in, in some way or another. Thank you. Yeah, Tom, one of the things that you have to remember, too, is that we're a, a veterans organization. We're a 501c3. We're not a political organization. So our, I guess, I mean, we, we certainly want people to support our goal of trying to get justice for our 34 fallen shipmates, but we're not going to make a lot of waves politically because we're, we're all part of military veteran organizations. Uh, the Disabled American Vets, the American Legion, the VFW, uh, American Veterans, uh, Military Order of the Purple Hearts. Um, they're, they're all non-political organizations. So, and I, I, don't, I don't see us getting, you know, too involved in, in coalitions that that are going to go against 
government policies. No, you've got uh, you've got your own uh, work to do just on that single issue, and uh, we really respect you for it. Yep. Well, I don't want to uh, end the meeting prematurely, but uh, uh, if we're not getting uh, more um, questions coming up. Uh, I'd like to ask something, Tom. Um, uh, I'm uh, uh, Jackie Taylor Basker. I am the cousin of Robert Casale. And Mr. Gallo, I was emailing you a couple of years ago. I was doing a documentary, coming down to do a documentary that I fell, I broke my leg, so I couldn't make it. But Robert Casale, who was on the USS Liberty, was supposed to be there, but he was out for training, so he survived. Uh, but I've been concerned about this since it was a family member involved in it. And uh, being in Israel, I think you all should know that there's a lot of Israelis, very anti, uh, I lived in Jordan for eight years teaching, and uh, a lot of Israeli soldiers, uh, they have a group called Breaking the Silence, which is composed of Israeli soldiers who are upset about what they had to do for the Israeli army. And they are aware of this issue. And I think actually uh, that there are uh, elements within Israel right now who uh, could be very supportive and helpful. And actually, I think some of the, the guys who were involved with it have confessed, right, have fessed up to what they did. And I think this is uh, 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 an important outreach that uh, we can come at it from both sides, perhaps. Thank you, Jackie. All right, I think it's time to, uh, to end the meeting. Um, again, with a great uh, note of thanks to our Li USS Liberty veterans and, uh, and we will uh, we will have follow-up, I know that. I'd like to stay in touch with you and I know that uh, Brooklyn for Peace is, is uh, uh, offering a lot of thanks and, and interest in continuing this. So uh, until another time in the near future, thank you again. Thank you very much again for having Bye. us. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Have a nice night, everyone. Be safe. Thank you. All right. Bye.